reading Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Chapter 16, Jesus is uh, teaching as he's usually doing and uh, making the most of his time and his ministry. And you have a squirrely group of uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, and they're kind of keeping together on the outskirts of the crowd that Jesus is teaching to. And they kind of make their way, and, and it's almost like they're inquiring. They're wanting to know more about Jesus. They're wanting to, know, to, to see if he's really uh, the Christ. But Jesus sees right through them, and they come up and they say, Show us a sign from heaven. And the reason they say that is because, well, only, only God can control the elements. Only God can control nature or has the power uh, over nature. So if Jesus can do a sign or perform some miracle that proves uh, that he is God through that, then maybe they'll believe. But really what they wanted to do was, was have something in which they could use on Jesus, some blackmail, some dirt, something to disprove his ministry and who Jesus was claiming to be. So Jesus does not give them a sign and then goes to his disciples and as soon as he shows up to the disciples, you can almost hear it in his voice, he says, beware of the scribes and Pharisees. They're poison. A, a, just a little bit of poison can ruin this, the entire purpose and reason that I'm here. Beware of those guys. And then he performs a miracle. They didn't bring food, they didn't bring uh, the, the bread or the fish and Jesus miraculously heals everybody there. But then after this, uh, we see that, that Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, and he does so in Caesarea Philippi. In Caesarea at the time, it was, it was saturated uh, by the Romans. Everywhere you looked when you were in Caesarea, I mean, it, it, Roman gods were everywhere. Caesar, their king, was on the coins. Their structures, those pillars, those iconic pillars, were everywhere in Caesarea Philippi. And even though uh, Peter is standing and he is sat, he's in that saturated society, he can still look at Jesus and say, you're the Christ. Even though he didn't fully understand what that meant, he still came to that conclusion on his own. And then right after that, Jesus tells him he has to die. And Jesus does die. And then he's risen from the dead like we know. But I want to fast forward now and go to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. We're going to spend uh, all of our time there this morning. I love this book. Uh, some people say that this is a book about joy, and that's true. Uh, he does talk about joy, but uh, the book of Philippians doesn't really point to one singular idea. It's actually a thank you note, uh, and it puts all of my thank you notes, every one that I've ever written, to shame. Uh, but Paul is in prison, and Epaphroditus comes up, and he gives him this financial gift to help him uh, along in his ministry, and it comes from that church uh, at Philippi. And so Paul decides to write a thank you note uh, on behalf uh, of that gift that he got, an inspired thank you note. But then he covers so many different things. He talks about two women that are arguing in the church and something that they need to get over, work through, and solve. Also something I've never put into a thank you note before. But he goes through all of these different ideas, these concepts for, for living for Christ, because that church is living in that same society. The, at this point, the, that area in Caesarea Philippi is filled with a bunch of retired Roman soldiers. They're hot-blooded patriots. They've spent their entire life serving Caesar, and now you have a group of people, Christians, proclaiming a, to serve another king and also trying to evangelize to these people. And so Paul writes a book, and he says some things that you would not expect someone in prison to say, such as, I've learned in all things to be content in uh, Philippians chapter 4. He also says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. He repeats it twice, so you didn't have any punctuation in ancient Greek. You had no exclamation marks, you had no question marks, but one of the ways in which those, the writers would place emphasis on something is they would simply repeat it twice. And so Paul says, rejoice and again, I say rejoice. You also see that again when he's talking to those two women who are in an argument, and they're bickering with one another. We're not told what the argument is about, and I think that's on purpose. It's because people tend to fight in churches a whole lot, and there are arguments, and there are, are things that cause division within the church. And so we just have this very vague idea. There was a big argument, and this is what Paul says to them. But he, he does the same thing. I urge you, Yodia, and I urge you, 
Syntyche. He's trying to put those exclamation marks. Listen, this is the emphasis here. And so he tries to tell them uh, to knock it off. That's what he, that, when you look at how he handles that situation with two ladies that are arguing with one another in the division in the church, he, he tells them basically just, you've got to solve this problem. Just figure it out and move on because there's a bigger purpose here. Back in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus talks a little bit about the cost of discipleship, and he tells his disciples, if anyone is to come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. Talking about the sacrifice that comes along with, with being a Christian. And so we see Paul is one of those people that is living this out. In fact, he says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 28, he says, if I die, well, that's, that's better for me. Living in this world is a whole lot harder. That's actually really the sacrifice here. Because if I die, I get to go see that God, my Savior, who I've been trying to live for this entire time while I've been here on earth. But if I stay here on this earth, then it's also for Christ too, because I'm going to go around and establish, establish groups of believers, families of believers, even in societies like Caesarea Philippi. But when he says... Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. It's a command. And sometimes I think that's one of those commands that just goes over our heads sometimes, because there, there are commands in the Bible that most normal people get. So there's the command, do not murder. But notice that you don't find any Bible verse that says, don't murder, and again I say, don't do it. We don't really need that. We don't, most people don't need to be told, seriously, don't murder someone. It's, it's not everyone's temptation here. It's not something that everybody struggles with, hopefully. But he does say that about rejoicing. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Why? Because it's hard. Some of the things that we learn about joy and, and some, how important it is for the Christian is because it, that is one of the ways in which we show the world that we're Christians. That's one of the ways in which the world can, can identify us as Christians. Let's just talk about the average Monday morning. When you walk into your office, how many memes do you see? Conversations are you in there just like, oh, Monday again. And they're dragging their feet and they look miserable. But who, who are the kinds of people that you gravitate to the most? Usually those that are joyful. I want you to think about if you have a, a kid, I'm gonna, maybe I'll make it too close to home for myself, but you get a speeding ticket. Your son or your daughter gets a speeding ticket. And so they go through this heart racing event where the, the red and, and blue lights are flashing in their rear view mirror and they have to go through that whole ordeal. The officer doesn't let him off. He's like, you've been going 105. I'm giving you a ticket. So the kid gets the ticket and he goes home to his parents and as soon as he opens the door, he sees his parents right there in the living room and he knows it's time for a talk or probably worse. And so all of the things that he thinks he's going to get grounded from or maybe some other horrible, uh, unusually cruel punishment maybe comes to mind and then the dad takes that kid into a room and just says, you know, I've made some mistakes too. I've done some bad things too, but God showed me mercy. God sent his son. You know, I will continue to do bad things. Even though I try and live for Christ, I continue to, to slip up from time to time. But God also gave me grace, which is something that I don't deserve. And so you decide as a parent in that particular situation to show mercy on the kid. Well, the next day, the kid goes to school, and all of his friends are there at school, and he begins to say, oh, you will not believe what happened. You know how I got pulled over yesterday? And they're all like, yeah. And he says, my dad showed me mercy. And maybe some of the conversations following after that are like, man, I wish my dad was like that. I wish I, wish I was a part of that family. And so the kid comes back from school, and then you start hearing all of these things, and it makes you feel pretty good about yourself because the, they start saying things like, man, everyone at school wants to be a part of our family. Now let's look at that in the Christian life. When we show joy, when we recognize what's been done for us, we've been shown mercy, we've been shown grace, why don't we go tell all our friends? Or why don't we go out into the world and say, you will not believe what my Father has done for me? Because it has that effect on people. People will walk away from that because it's contagious, and they'll say, I want to be a part of that family. When Paul is talking about joy, he's not talking about a feeling. He's talking about a lifestyle, something that you continue to do. And that's a pattern that we see in the Bible. When we're told to love, it's, it's sacrificial love, not a feeling. When we're told to have joy, it's an action. It's not something that we're supposed to feel on a daily basis, though there are feelings associated with Christianity. We can't write those off. Because when you think about where we would be without Christ and when you think about what we have 
in Christ, the hope that we have, all the blessings that come along with being a Christian, being a part of this family, it feels pretty good. It feels really good. But Paul, as he goes throughout this lesson, he says, I've learned to be content in all things in chapter 4. And when you think about the fact that he's writing this uh, from a Roman prison, which is, is no picnic either, he's able to say all of these things because of what Christ has done for him. He's living for Christ. Another way that you can put that, and when you look at the first chapter, Philippians 1 and verse 28, when he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, what he is saying is Christ is my life. In Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul is, is writing, he says that nature it eliminates everybody's excuses. Nature points to the designer, the creator of the universe and the world around them. So no one has an excuse. And maybe you were one of those people that would talk and be like, uh, uh, you know, throw out these scenarios like, well, what about that guy that's on an island in the middle of the ocean and no one even knows that that island exists and it's him and his wife and his dog who teaches them the gospel how do they know about christ how do they know that god exists well romans chapter one says i've planted things literally everywhere that points back to a creator humans we were we were born with this desire to look up to, to look for something greater to look for something outside of ourselves it's like you take a magnifying glass and you look at a leaf and you see all of those intricate designs and stuff, there's God. You take a microscope and go even smaller, there's God. It's all intricate and it's all beautifully connected together and it points back to, the, to that designer. But there's also something in nature. If you're a, uh, a documentary nerd or if you like nature documentaries, um, I am, uh, you'll, you'll see that there are, some, there are some creatures that mimic other creatures. They're usually in the prey mimicking the predator. But you have uh, the coral snake, very deadly, killed lots of people. Then you have the milk snake, which is like uh, the, the cousin who's not nearly as cool, but he looks like the coral snake. Same patterns. You have red and black is on, is on the coral snake to show that it's this deadly and venomous serpent. And then you have the milk snake, which is black and red. So the pattern's a little bit off, but it has bright colors. It's not poisonous at all. A lot of people have them for pets, but it's trying to look like something that's far more poisonous. And then you have this really weird bug called the peanut bug or the alligator bug, and it has this peanut-shaped head, and it has a couple different uh, weird ways to defend itself. Like it can shoot gas out of the little peanut-shaped thing. You can look it up. It exists. It's, it's very weird looking. But it also has this other technique that it uses uh, that it'll be up on a branch, and if a bat or if a bird is trying to swoop down and eat that peanut bug, the peanut bug will leap from the branch and it'll spread its wings out, and it looks like it has two owl eyes on its wings. It looks just like the face of an owl. It's really, really cool, but it's not an owl. What Paul is saying and what he's trying to get across to the Philippians is don't look like Christ. Don't, don't look like a Christian from the outside, but make Christ your life. To live is Christ. Is Christ your life or do you, do you just put on a tie, put on a coat, slap on some boots, walk to church and say, now I look like a Christian. I'm going to be a Christian today. And then tomorrow, you take the costume off when you're at work. And then when you come back on Wednesday night, if you come back on Wednesday night, you put back on your Christian costume, zip the whole thing up. That's not the idea that Paul's trying to get across. If you want to have joy, if you want to be content in all things, make Christ your life. It doesn't matter if you're in prison. It doesn't matter if you're a small, struggling congregation in a world that absolutely hates you, like the church at Philippi were. Make Christ your life. Because that is the life that is filled with joy. That is the life that teaches you how to love people. And that is the only life that, that God can take and use for a greater purpose. Are you a part of that family? That's really what, what Paul is trying to get across to Yodia and Syntyche, where they're arguing with each other when he says, get it together. You're part of something bigger. You're part of something better. That's your sister. That, we're a family as the church. And so Paul, as he's talking to them, saying, have joy, be content, solve your problems because we're doing something greater here. If you're not a part of that family this morning, but you would like to be, today is a great time to do that. The Baptist, baptistry waters are ready. If you've been thinking about becoming a Christian, if you've been thinking about putting on Christ, then you can do that. You can start fresh today. It's a beautiful, sunny day to do that. But if you're someone who's struggling, maybe you haven't been to church in a while, 
or maybe there's something that's pulling you away from Christ constantly. Maybe something that you can think of that you're like, I just can't let it go. I've tried in the past, but there's something that's still holding you back. Look around. There's a lot of people here that do care about you and that do love you, that can help you get over whatever spiritual problem that you have. If there's something that we can help you with this morning, then why not come together as we stand and as we sing?